Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown and today we'll be looking at part six of our seven part series over chapter 17. We're going to finish up 17.5 and then take a look at chapter section 17.7. .7. Now we looked yesterday right at the end at there are three situations that can affect the solubility of a uh, solid in water and we looked at how common ion effect can have an influence on the solubility. We looked at how uh, pH can have an effect on the solubility, but what we didn't get into yet is complex ion formation. Now we've talked about complex ions a couple of times, but this is the first time we're really going to get into the formation of it and get in a little bit deeper. So we've seen them, but now we're really going to get into understanding them. Now metal ions can bond to a group of surrounding molecules or ions to form what's called a metal complex, a covalent coordinate complex ion or molecule situation. Now what we're usually looking at here is complex ions. So something like silver plus one can react with ammonia to make a complex. It's a large ion formed by the nitrogen coming in with its unshared pair. Remember, have, pair, will, share. That's a Lewis base. So ammonia is acting like a Lewis base here and it's sharing those electron pairs with the silver. And it's forming a large conglomerate new substance. So we started with an ion, now we have a larger complex ion formed between the metal and what's known as a ligand. Now, the rule for complex ion formation is that the number of Lewis bases that bond to the metal is often equal to twice the metal ion's charge. So silver is a plus one, double that is two, so notice two ammonias bond to the silver. It doesn't work all of the time, but it works 80 to 90 percent of the time. And if you apply this rule on the AP test, even if you draw an improper metal complex, they're still going to give you full credit for it. So unless you know differently, unless you're given exactly what it is, use this rule. So something like silver, should bond two things to it. Now metal ions can act as Lewis acids then. So the ammonia, NH3, has the electron pair in its sharing, so that's a Lewis base. So the metal ion is actually acting like a Lewis, a Lewis acid to form a complex ion with these, this Lewis base ammonia. Now that Lewis base is what's commonly referred to as a ligand. So if you ever hear the term ligand, it's the Lewis base that's involved in the complex ion formation. Now, ammonia, cyanide, hydroxide, those are all common ligands. So you'll tend to see when we look at some different metal complex, those are often the substances that are in there. Water and other things can do it too. They just have to be attracted to the metal ion. Now, complex ion formation can dramatically increase the solubility of a metal salt. So if you take a look at something like silver chloride, which has a very, very low solubility, so it's going to have a very small KSP. Well, since silver can complex with ammonia, that's effectively going to lower the concentration of the silver ions in solution because they're becoming the metal complex, so they're no longer silver ions and can't react with the chloride, well, that's going to shift equilibrium to the right, which is increasing the solubility of the silver chloride. That's why we're looking at it at this point, because if you have a low solubility substance that forms a metal cation that will complex, if you add that complexing ligand to it, you're going to increase the solubility of that substance. So you can see a long list here of a bunch of different types of ions that will form metal complexes. Now notice they have large KF values. That's going to tell you that they shift equilibrium to the right, which means they favor the formation of the metal complex. So when you put any of these things in solution with the various cations, it's going to dramatically decrease the amount of that metal cation solution, which is going to shift the equilibrium far to the right, which is going to significantly increase the solubility of those things. So that's why we're looking at complex ions formation at this point. It's because it can have an effect on the solubility of those low solubility solids. Now, let's take a look at a problem here where we're going to be using this to understand how we can actually increase the solubility in a certain way. To what final concentration of NH3 must a solution be adjusted to dissolve 0.01 moles of AgCl in one liter of solution? So that means we want to make 0.010 molar AgCl. That's our intent here. And since the KSP of this reaction uh, which I don't yet yeah, listed right here. Since the KSP of this AgCl dissolving reaction is so low, that means not very much of this stuff actually dissolves. So its solubility is going to be very, very, very small. Well, we want to increase the solubility to this amount. And we can do that by adding ammonia to form these silver 
ammonia complex, therefore lowering the concentration of the silver, increasing the concentration of the chloride, and increasing the solubility of the silver chloride. So we start by looking at the reaction itself. So Ag is going to react to make Ag plus and Cl minus in solution. And once we reach saturation, we have an equilibrium condition set up. And since Ag times Cl one to one has to equal the Ksp, that means that Ag would equal 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10th divided by the chloride. Well, in this particular case, we want the chloride to be 0 0.010 molar. So that would be our concentration at the point we're looking at here for our chloride. So we know that silver at this particular point, if chloride concentration gets that high, the silver concentration is going to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative 8th. So we're basically using our KSP expression here to determine at this new concentration of chloride, what must our silver ion concentration going to be. Now the next thing we're going to do here, if I can get rid of the garbage, it's already on the screen is take a look at the silver complex portion. Remember, we need to remove enough silver, and that means we're making a whole bunch of our silver complex here, to get the solubility increased to that point. Well, remember, by our Kf expression here, it would be the metal complex concentration over silver concentration, and the ammonium concentration squared has to equal Kf, which was 1, point, or 1 times 10 to the 7th from the table we looked at a second ago. Now, remember, just a second ago, we looked at what the silver is basically going to be technically the same as the chloride at that concentration 0.010 oh molar, but all that silver is turning into this thing. So that tells us that with by this equation that the actual concentration of the metal complex is going to be that 0.01. And on the previous page, we looked at what the silver concentration would be when we're at equilibrium at the prosper uh, solubility, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 8. We can plug that in and we can solve for what the ammonia concentration needs to be. So in order to reach that solubility and dissolve that much chloride, we need 0.20 molar ammonia. So we basically need to add enough ammonia to the mix to end up with a 0.2 molar concentration. And at that point, we would have increased the solubility of the silver chloride to the point that we determined. Next thing that's mentioned in this section, we're not going to spend long on this, but I want to briefly mention it, more as a way to clear up a potential misconception. Amphitirism and amphiprotic, there are similar types of things, and they're related, but they're not the exact same thing. Amphiprotic is a type of amphitirism. Amphiprotic, we looked at earlier. When you have a substance that can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base or as a Bronsted Bronsted Lowry acid, it is amphiprotic. In other words, it can accept or give a hydrogen ion. Well, not all things can act like acids or bases by giving hydrogen ions. If you're giving a hydrogen ion and you can accept a hydrogen ion, then you're acting like an acid or base, and that particular idea, that particular type of situation, is known as amphiprotic. Well, a more general term is amphitirism. Amphitirism is when you're acting like an acid or base under all conditions, not just accepting uh, or receiving protons. So you can be a Lewis acid or base, functioning as either one, and not really be gaining or losing protons. So it's technically not amphiprotic, but it is acting like an acid or base. So in the more general term, it's behaving amphitiric. So some metal oxides and metal hydroxides that commonly form metal complexes have the ability to act like an acid or a base. So they can react with an acid or a base and therefore be acting like a Lewis acid or base. Things like aluminum, zinc, and tin too commonly do this. So you can see aluminum hydroxide, so we have an aluminum solid here. If we mixed it with something like hydrochloric acid, that would be donating H pluses. So in this particular case, it's acting like a base. It's accepting that proton. Now, if you're looking at it in terms of what's happening with Lewis acids um, and Lewis bases, in this particular case, that proton does not have an electron pair. So somewhere in that ALOH3, something is accepting a proton. So it's acting like an acid in this case. It can react with an acid, and the, or I should say it's acting like a base. It can react with the acid, therefore it must be functioning like a base. Or if you throw in sodium hydroxide, it can actually react with that sodium hydroxide, taking on the hydroxide, which means it's acting like an acid. So aluminum hydroxide is an example of a substance that can display acid or base behavior. So therefore, it's amphotyric.
and that's displaying amphitheorism. Now, one kind of aside here before we get to the last section, 17.6. There's a question in homework that people routinely struggle with, so I want to give you a couple hints. It's talking about three different K values. Remember, we have KSPs, KAs, KBs, KQs, KCs, KPs, KFs. Look at the reaction K and write the reaction that would be associated with that K. And then look at those three reactions and see how you can rearrange them so they'll add up to form the target equation. And remember at that point, when you add things together, what that does to their K values to get to the new K value. If you can't remember, page three or 638 will help you with that. Or you can go back to your last chapter's notes. So that's my help about question number 62. Okay, to finish up today, precipitation and the separation of ions. Well, when you have a low solubility substance and you throw it in water, it will dissolve and create those ions until it reaches saturation. At that point, it stops dissolving. And you're going to get to equilibrium fairly quickly. Well, we're throwing the solid in. And as long as we throw enough in there, we know we'll get to equilibrium. If you're approaching equilibrium from the opposite angle, let's say we're not adding silver chloride, but we're adding chloride ions to silver ions, those can come together to make the silver chloride. If their concentrations are high enough, then we reach saturation and we have an equilibrium system. If they're not high enough, then we're not going to form a precipitate. A solid isn't going to form because we never got to the point of the saturation point. We never reached the solubility and beyond of the solid. So if we're looking at the K value and we're not sure for an equilibrium, we technically call that a Q. So this goes back to something we did last chapter, Qs versus Ks. In this case, we're just looking at KSPs. Now, if we calculate our Q and it equals the KSP, that tells us the system is equilibrium, the solution is saturated. So we added just enough to reach saturation. Now, if Q is less than K, that means we didn't have enough ions in there in solution to reach saturation. So the solid is going to basically dissolve until Q equals KSP. Now, if the Q was greater than the KSP, that means the ion concentrations were great enough that you're going to reach saturation beyond and you're going to form precipitate. So what you basically do is compare the calculated Q value to KSP. If Q is greater than KSP, you had enough ions to make a precipitate. If Q is less than KSP, you don't have enough ions to reach a precipitate. You'd have to have more of the ions to reach our saturation point, and therefore you're not going to get a precipitate. And if Q exactly equals KSP, then you're going to have a saturated system, but you didn't have enough to form the precipitate. You don't have any extras. So that's really what this comes down to. So let's take a look at a problem. You've got 0 0.10 liters of a 8.0 times 10 to the negative 3 molar concentration of lead nitrate, and that's going to be added to 0 0.40 liters of that concentration of sulfate. Now the first thing you need to do is evaluate what's going to potentially form our insoluble product here. Well, sodium is always soluble, nitrate is always soluble. Those things are meaningless in these two situations. So what we're really looking at is lead coming together to make lead sulfate, which is a relatively low solubility substance. Now the KSP for that particular reaction, lead ions plus sulfate ions to make lead sulfate or lead sulfate dissolving to make lead and sulfate ions is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 7. So this is a low solubility substance. You don't have very high solubilities, but when you write the KS pre-expression, that would then be the lead times the sulfate has to equal our K value. Well, if we're not sure, because we've contributed lead ions and sulfate ions, if we're at equilibrium or not, and we're not sure if we've performed a precipitate precipitate or not, instead of calculating a K, what we're doing is calculating a Q, because we're not really sure where we're at in terms of equilibrium. Now keep in mind, we combine two things of two different volumes together. So what does that affect? Think about it. I'm not going anywhere until you process this. What happens to these things when we mix them together and get a new volume? We dilute them. So one of the things we have to do in the process of this problem is calculate what this concentration is and calculate what that concentration is. Now we know that for if this is the molality of the lead nitrate, then that's the molality of the lead. If we multiply that by its original volume, we know how many moles of lead ions we have. If we divide that by our total volume, we'll get the new concentration. And then we turn around and do that same thing for the sulfate. So what we're going to do in the process of this calculation 
is really first establish what these concentrations are. You take the volume times the molarity, and you've got how many moles at the old volume, and then divide by the new volume to the new concentration. And once we've done that for both things, we can plug those in and calculate Q. So 1.6 times 10 to the negative 3 times 4.0 times 10 to the negative 3 gives me 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6. So that's our Q value. Remember, we're looking at how Q compares to K. Now, since K was KSP, 6.3 times 10 to the negative seventh, that means Q is greater than K. We have enough ions to reach saturation. We're going to get a precipitate forming. And that ends our sixth set of notes over chapter 17.